Beneath the lightless depths of the North Atlantic, entombed in fathomless black and gripped by ghostly silence, lies the remnants of a lost world, the RMS Titanic. Once the pride of the White Star Line and the epitome of luxury, she now looms as a spectral memento of mankind's arrogance. Having set sail from Southampton on her maiden voyage on the 10th of April 1912, over 700 third-class passengers boarded mostly immigrants clinging to visions of a fresh start in a new land. Yet for many, their dreams would be swallowed into a freezing abyss, fates sealed by the Leviathan's lethal brush with destiny. Join us as we delve into the harrowing final hours and the unspeakable things that happened to the Titanic's third-class passengers. The third class. When the Titanic set off on its fateful maiden voyage in 1912, it was hailed as the paragon of luxury, and deemed unsinkable. Yet beneath the veneer of luxury and grandiosity, there existed a stark disparity between the classes aboard the Leviathan vessel. No group embodied this contrast more than the third-class passengers, hopeful emigrants seeking sanctuary in America's promised shores. For them, the Titanic was a beacon promising a new life unencumbered by old shackles. A third-class Titanic ticket cost 15 to 40 U.S. dollars, equivalent to a hefty $424 to $1,130 in today's money. This represented almost two months' wages for most passengers, a sizable drain on meager savings accumulated through backbreaking toil. And yet, they boarded the ship of dreams, with optimism running high, armed with dreams infused by the promises of the new world. Before being allowed on board, all third-class ticket holders underwent vigorous health checks by crew members trained to look for infectious diseases. Titanic carried a medical team headed by Dr. William O'Loughlin, which inspected passengers and returned tickets stamped for approval based on their perceived cleanliness. The White Star Line took measures to prevent onboard outbreaks, though medical care once aboard still fell well short of the standards enjoyed in first class. There was only one surgeon, Dr. Simpson, to attend to hundreds of steerage passengers. Two stewards named Alice Leader and Elizabeth Dowdell assisted Dr. O'Loughlin in caring for third-class women and children. A single hospital contained just four beds for nearly 700 third-class travelers compared to much better equipped medical facilities available for wealthier passengers on other decks. A realm of extremes. The RMS Titanic epitomized luxury catering to elite patrons accustomed to indulgent lifestyles ashore. The first-class quarters were a translation of such lavish comforts to the high seas, featuring palatial suites with private promenade decks, a magnificent dining saloon adorned with a glass dome and electric chandeliers, serving up to ten exquisite courses per meal under the esteemed care of master chefs. Social establishments like the elegant Café Parisienne offered the ambiance of a sidewalk retreat amidst Parisian trellises and ivy, while a fully equipped gymnasium, supervised by a professional instructor, boasted cutting-edge fitness contraptions. Even exotic Turkish baths promised therapeutic heat treatments, marking the pinnacle of nautical decadence to rival the finest hotels worldwide. The ship's orchestra performed live soothing symphonies daily, transporting the upper crust gathered in saloons. For the creme de la creme gliding across Titanic's polished oak and mahogany-accented hallways during its doomed maiden voyage, life was an endless gala of leisure and self-indulgence even amidst the open Atlantic seas. In stark contrast to these rarefied comforts, deep within Titanic's bowels lay far more modest lodgings and utilitarian public spaces allocated for third-class passengers primarily hopeful emigrants bound for America, clutching dreams rather than social pedigree. While basic compared to the lavish staterooms upstairs, the cabins themselves represented radical improvements from most contemporary shipping standards, offering amenities like running water, electric lights, and enameled panel walls instead of exposed metal. Shared public areas, like the rudimentary dining halls, smoking rooms, and open galleries, fostered community among diverse souls from numerous homelands. Yet these relative advancements below deck could hardly conceal the severe disparities in provisions across classes. 
This dichotomy is sharply highlighted by survivor accounts and loss statistics, heavily slanted against third-class occupants. Behind all the fanfare surrounding Titanic's luxury and size, the allocation of four bathtubs for over 700 occupants shockingly spotlights why some dub it a floating manifestation of class inequities. Furthermore, gates under U.S. immigration laws sectioned off areas, minimizing contact and cordoning third-class passengers to lower parts of the ship. Signs of class divides emerged in leisure activities and mealtime routines for passengers occupying different quarters in this microcosm of society afloat on water. Their experiences living aboard this ship varied dramatically depending upon the portion of Titanic they could access. As tragedy struck, Gateways and hallways meant to maintain exclusivity transformed into obstructive barriers and confusing labyrinths, dictating entirely different odds of survival for those residing on separate decks. The Daily Grind There were no luxuriant salons or plush libraries for third-class traveling in steerage, of course, just modest designated areas where they could socialize, momentarily escaping cramped rooms. One such oasis, was the smoke room tucked away on deck C between tourist third-class cabins and the dining area. As the name suggests, this space provided a dedicated smoking area for men reminiscent of cozy gentlemen's clubs that defined social realms in that era. Comfortably furnished, it opened directly across from the galley containing cooking apparatus to service adjacent third-class dining rooms. Constructed of varnished teak and mahogany, the smoke lounge measuring approximately 30 by 18 feet featured windows along its longer side that could open, allowing refreshing sea winds inside. Unlike the smoke room's exclusivity, a larger, more openly accessible area called the general room facilitated the mixing of passengers farther below on sea deck. As the White Star Line 1912 handbooks for Titanic crew indicate, it was intended as a lively space akin to general quarters for troops on military ships. Hence the name. Though actually less cheering than strategically positioned for convenience, it was built along the third-class section of the ship, making movement easier for stewards attending to either group. Furnished wooden benches attached atop mostly unpaneled walls lined parts of its 50 by 30 feet expanse. The rest remained open floor space encircled by lone movable chairs, it connected directly to two stairways for the throngs in steerage, besides arched entryways from passage corridors making circulation seamless. The Dining Area In old photos showing the Titanic's dining saloon specially built to host elite passengers, one beholds resplendent interiors outfitted to transport diners into luxurious escapism. Expanses of gleaming mahogany carved into delicate Rococo-style wall panels and chairs exude restrained opulence. Sparkling chandeliers overhead cast their bright but warm glow upon damask table linen underneath. Crystal wine glasses and fine silverware chime against deluxe porcelain bearing the white star crest in gold. Uniformed stewards expertly pour champagne from gracefully leaning posture as if performing choreographed artistry. In this rarefied atmosphere, every aspect from food to furnishings makes mealtimes an aesthetic experience denied to those of humble birth. For third-class lodgers, though, dining provisions on board Titanic followed an entirely different physical and philosophical format. Two mess rooms capable of collectively accommodating 470 travelers were located on the same deck as the first-class dining saloon, but at the opposite end. Paneled in unvarnished pine with white ceilings, these functional spaces facilitated efficient shifting of human traffic in and out during scheduled meal services. Long, refectory-style trestle tables dominated their simple decor scheme, matching basic bentwood chairs. Thin curtains mounted high near cornices rather ineffectually shielded from cold drafts, while giant metal milk urns visible in corners implied institutional austerity. It was not a room for lingering, but for quickly replenishing between other activities given its high-occupancy turnover constraints. The Sinking Ship During the late hours of April 14th, while Titanic was barreling through icy Atlantic waters at nearly 26 miles per hour, lookouts Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee reported sighting a hulking iceberg emerge from the hazy darkness less than 500 yards ahead. First Officer Murdoch ordered evasive maneuvers starboard, 
which likely spared a head-on collision, but could not prevent the floating mountain from grazing and rupturing Titanic's side. Gasps of alarm rippled through as the iceberg glided by the deck just before midnight, appearing deceptively peaceful despite inflicting mortal harm to the unsinkable ship. Thomas Andrews, the architect of the Titanic, assessed the flooding and damage shortly after. The gashes stretched across six watertight compartments towards the bow, one too many for survival based on her safety design specs. Captain Smith was grimly informed that his cherished vessel would founder in under two hours. As the scale of damage revealed itself, Smith ordered wireless operators Phillips and Bride to begin transmitting distress signals. He also directed the crew to start loading and lowering the lifeboats. Murdoch and 2nd Officer Light Oler interpreted the women and children first protocol differently. The former allowed men to board if no women or children were around while latter stuck rigidly to the edict. This seeded confusion especially since Titanic was severely understocked with lifeboats. Sixteen wood and four collapsible ones capable of carrying barely 50% on board. As the dreaded realization set in, a remarkably orderly exodus started initially. The upper classes had easier access to the boats from the boat deck and exerted cultural pressure to be prioritized. The technical challenges of navigating a sinking megaship also meant third-class passengers in further astern compartments stood disadvantaged from timely evacuation into unfamiliar terrain. Some like Daniel Buckley spoke of no impediment, but other testimonies and recovered bodies imply not everyone escaped. By 1.30 a.m., distraught wives were torn from husbands and families as only women and children were permitted to escape aboard the early boats. Millionaires Benjamin Guggenheim and Isidore Strauss moved to stay back and face consequences rather than using privilege as lifesavers. Meanwhile, the ship's fate was sealed as flooded bows gradually upended the entire structure from its original majestic form. Myths versus Reality Titanic's swift toppling sequence soon swallowed hundreds of gentlemen, chiefly emigrant passengers occupying modest third-class cabins towards lower desk areas. Compared to wealthier patrons residing in plush rooms, first-class suites above, these steerage travelers held limited options for reacting once ice waters invaded since most boats were already depleted minutes after the collision. Significant loss therefore concentrated amongst hopeful immigrant families because regulations structurally hindered their escaping easily. Or did they? Common Hollywood portrayals depict gates barring exit stairs with crew callously keeping gates locked. Even water rose drowning poor passengers helplessly behind metal bars. Were steerage truly trapped below deliberately? In reality, while regulations mandated segregating classes, minimize disease transmission risk under 1907 U.S. immigration laws targeting immigrant inspection processing Ellis Island, no verified events support the trapped behind barricaded cage hypothesis. Inquiries interviewing surviving passengers found most gates serve ornamental purposes, not jail cells. Irish young migrant Daniel Buckley clearly refuted malicious imprisonment notions, altogether declaring equal prospects fleeing above decks, regardless of ticket privilege. Architectural barriers proved inconvenient navigation more than intentional restraints against lower groups. Other well-known blockade reports of steerage passengers led by Burke were similarly rectified later, just small waist-level unlocked hatches easily removed once annoyingly discovered. No explicitly verified incidents showed locked exits preventing stair access when evacuation was urgently required. Neither did the crew actively restrain steerage folk migrating upper decks obeying protocol and prioritizing women and children. Confusion, not conspiracy, primarily prevented more saved that night Titanic sank. But the aftermath still paints a harsh reality. A mere 25% survival rate for third-class passengers starkly overshadowed by the comparatively higher survival rates of 42% for second-class and a more privileged 62% for first-class passengers. This glaring contrast unveils a deeply rooted injustice, exposing the systemic biases that translated into tangible life and death consequences. While third-class passengers might not have endured the extreme portrayals often depicted in Hollywood, 
The statistics show the unequal footing these individuals faced, emphasizing the profound inequities that played out amidst the chaos, leaving third-class passengers disproportionately vulnerable to the unforgiving elements of that ill-fated night. Another belief hints at the Titanic's failure to provide enough lifeboats mainly due to the White Star Line deprioritizing safety over aesthetics and cost. Alexander Carlyle actually resigned from his chief designer role over being overruled on adding more lifeboats, an eerily prophetic dispute given ensuing events. Ship owners like J. Bruce Ismay didn't anticipate all passengers requiring evacuation simultaneously and applied outdated regulations and metrics for provisioning to their folly. Chaos in the shadow of death. If the gates were not the primary cause of the significant death toll among third-class passengers on the Titanic, what actually transpired? The failure lies squarely in the absence of clear process protocols amidst intense prioritization of women and children versus men. In stressful and ambiguous situations, many individuals hesitated, awaiting guidance that never came, instead proactively navigating upwards themselves. Remarkably, a few lower-class travelers in the third berth were aware of the detailed layout directions towards the top deck, where the lifeboats were located. These lifeboats were scarce and numbered, and those rendered hesitant faced formidable layout challenges when attempting solo escapes, unlike their drilled first-class counterparts, who were habituated to indicated emergency routes via boat diagrams throughout their accommodations. The latter enjoyed access to marked staircases directly leading to davit-launched lifeboats, while immense and enviable linen rooms remained strikingly off-limits to immigrant groups below. Structurally ignorant of critical evacuation trajectories, these passengers were stuck relying on explicit instructions in steerage gathering halls and succumbed to rapid submergence, with water penetrating their sections swiftly. The vessel's doomed angles shifted violently skyward, unbolted furnishings creating a deadly pinball effect in chaotic corridors. Stairways suddenly became impassably steep amidst relentless flooding, causing immense disorientation for patrons struggling to orient themselves when no prior familiarization tours were provided, unlike for first-class arrivals. Adding to the complexity, most foreigners spoke little comprehensible English during those decades before affordable translations and the written directional signs featured cryptic symbols rather than simple, showcased artwork arrows. Different from the universal visuals we have today, technology lagged behind, replaced by human stewards demonstrating drills. Verbal-only commands disappeared, proving ineffectual when overwhelmed stewards were occupied above. Left to their own devices, chaotic emergency wayfinding significantly affected third-class passengers who were unfamiliar with the floor plan and lacked clear instructions when seconds counted between rapidly sinking decks. The biggest injustice that occurred that night was the positioning of third-class passengers farthest from the lifeboats, mostly reserved for first- and second-class passengers. Third-class passengers had to travel a longer distance and face more obstacles to reach the boat deck reducing their chances of securing a seat on a lifeboat. Some lifeboats were launched before third-class passengers could even reach them, leaving them with almost no option to escape. Based on recovered victim numbers, scholars deduce over a thousand occupants remained inside during the Titanic's final descent under the Atlantic. Fewer than 15% of victims from third class were retrieved compared to over 30% across higher classes, who had easier outer deck access. As the last lifeboats pulled away, thousands still thronged boundaries of their metal tomb, nervously anticipating rescue while precious minutes were lost launching half-full boats by fastidious crewmen. Their shocked, indignant, and pleading cries echoing in the freezing night were the unheard requiems signaling a 70% third-class mortality rate. Those already flooded below decks certainly endured unspeakable horrors, gushing whirlpools, electric explosions, slammed debris, and bone-chilling icy waters claiming them before merciful drowning. Suffocated silence eventually greeted witnesses as Titanic's lights flickered out one last time before she disappeared under the waves for eternity. For those trapped inside by fortuitous missteps or loss of will, the end was prolonged and terrifying as the ship tore itself apart in its death throes 500 feet below. 
Their final moments were unrecorded, but undeniably traumatic. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. Whenever talking about the unspeakable things that happened to the Titanic's third-class passengers, the first things that come to mind are the gates and locks. The legends tell of ruthless crew members locking third-class passengers during the evacuation, callously dooming hundreds below deck. In reality, detailed government inquiries revealed only a single padlocked gate complaint by Irishman Daniel Buckley, which was quickly broken open by angry men. Titanic had minimal physical barriers segregating classes, and stewards urged passengers to move upwards almost an hour after collision. But the gates, although few, still contributed to the tragedy. In the scenario of life and death, they slowed down and hindered passengers when every minute counted. Inadequate guidance from the crew, the challenging labyrinthine anatomy of the ship, and apathy from stress likely impeded more third-class evacuees rather than intentional deprivation. Nonetheless, the gates became symbolic of the great class disparity on the Titanic. What are your views on the class difference that was in the Titanic? Let us know in the comments below. First, deaths preceding mass calamity. Before the scenes of abject turmoil and mass casualties in freezing darkness could sear themselves into survivors' eternal memories, Smaller, more private horrors claim the earliest victims trapped by circumstances below. Among the initial casualties following the collision's destructive jolt were post office clerks who had been laboring hard since Southampton to organize all the mail on D-Deck. Popular legend assumed that Titanic's very first fatality involved the postmaster, James Williamson, leading five assistants who drowned in the inundated postrooms while trying to retrieve precious registered letters. Some variants fancifully painted Chief Clerk Williamson heroically going down after freeing others, their bags clutched determinedly sinking forever with their missives, as a dutiful guardian protecting professional oaths unto death. Setting aside salacious imagery, the truth proves far less dramatic, yet equally regrettable. Eyewitnesses who last saw personnel on duty confirmed postal staff working frantically, moving unsorted mailbags upstairs to the passenger reception area to escape the rising waters. None perished bravely chained inside deliberately sealed vaults, honoring duty over life in the sensational way movies portrayed it later. Officers afterward testified that all clerks and mailroom staff abandoned their respective posts, once ordered to the top decks, indicating that procedures for saving themselves prevailed over regulations for protecting postal cargo. Their bodies were eventually recovered, floating amongst the wreckage the next morning, providing evidence enough that no one lingered behind intentionally sealed hatches. Fate dealt a crueler blow to engineering crewmen Jonathan Shepard and Herbert Harvey, who were whisked away in the earliest bursts of torrents. They did not die for mailbags, but in a selfless attempt to aid each other before the waves overwhelmed the boiler rooms. On that Sunday when fractured ice glanced off steel, Shepard on duty in boiler room 5, sprained a severely injured leg, tumbling unseen through an open hatchway. Loyal shipmates carried the immobilized casualty into a nearby pump room to clear the flooding workspace, hoping to wait out the crisis there. Alas, the collapsing watertight bulkhead released a thousand gallons per minute deluge off the starboard bow, crashing through everything, including the makeshift shelter they had retreated into. With the inrush suddenly drowning the room, the quick-thinking crewmate rushed upstairs to escape, but remembered that Shepard still lay helpless below. Turning back towards the foaming surge, Harvey tried to haul out his trapped colleague, but fierce currents bashed them hard against iron walls and ragged debris as relentless black swells snatched their exhausted forms into the dark world underneath. The 32-year-old Shepard was officially logged as the first human loss when Titanic's riven lower hull admitted the hungry Atlantic abyss before 1,500 others followed. His body was never found, unlike some crewmen who met similar ends that traumatic night. The ultimate sacrifice of rescuing another wasn't an alien concept in maritime services, drilled into men with either. Harvey appeared like those stalwart types himself, originally from Hampshire, entering the Merchant Navy at 19 as a trimmer tending coal furnaces on steamships before joining White Lines in 1912. What felled Titanic's first casualties 
wasn't mailroom heroics, but a cruel chance of stumbling wrong place followed by selfless reactions when disaster struck without warning. Unsinkable Molly Brown. The decks of Titanic hosted personages ranging from tycoons and aristocrats to impoverished migrants stacked in modest berths, but a few stood out for their later roles amid tragedy and rescue. In the haloed orbit of the first-class elite, swanned names that likely graced the front pages of high-society gossip rags, Astor, Guggenheim, Strauss, Widener, and more. Yet none shone as luminously as Margaret Brown, Margaret Brown forever etched in history as the unsinkable Molly Brown, earned this moniker through her courageous actions aboard lifeboat number six. Returning from Egypt, this Colorado socialite turned activist commanded admiration for her unwavering honesty and compassion. When the Titanic succumbed to its icy nemesis, Brown emerged as a beacon of leadership, urging the lifeboat to turn back for survivors and motivating rowers to take action. Despite facing resistance from the apprehensive quartermaster, Robert Hitchens, who feared being overwhelmed by those in the water, Brown stood her ground. She also clashed with Hitchens over his treatment of the women on the boat, challenging his orders for silence and stillness. Even on the rescue ship Carpathia, Brown tirelessly aided fellow survivors, solidifying her enduring legacy. The crew of Titanic Far removed from such elite orbits were most working-class crew members, including senior wireless operator Jack Phillips and band leader Wallace Hartley, whose courage under duress became the stuff of lore. Hartley reportedly led his music troupe valiantly through the last hours, transitioning from upbeat ragtime numbers aimed at maintaining morale to more somber hymns like Nearer My God to Thee as tragedy hit home. All eight musicians, including Hartley, perished, but their memory carries on in myths and memorials for choosing professional duty over self-preservation. Phillips, too, stayed doggedly at his post alongside assistant Harold Bride, sending alerts until water seeped in before perishing at age 25. However, Phillips also made some mistakes that may have contributed to the disaster. Phillips did not pass on some of the iceberg warnings he received from other ships. He also ignored a message from the Californian, which was nearby and could have helped, because he was annoyed by the interruption. Bride later admitted that they used the wrong distress signal, CQD, instead of the newer SOS, which might have confused some of the potential rescuers. In a wireless world still in its infancy, his efforts conveyed both the significance and fallibility of long-distance radio communications for the first time. Such were just two of the countless souls writing their own stories aboard RMS Titanic, some shining as beacons before being cruelly doused midway by tragedy, others attaining unsought fame only through disastrous twists of fortune. But together, all 2,200 occupants contributed their own unique brushes to painting a complex human story around a legendary voyage remembered over a century later. The ship might have later sunk beneath the cold Atlantic waves, but the spirits remain immortalized in legend. Ripple effects from tragedy. Inquiries seeking answers and accountability for the avoidable loss of 1,500-plus lives in Titanic's sinking triggered a series of positive reforms improving marine transportation safety for posterity. As investigative teams peeled layers behind contributing lapses, they illuminated a dangerous paradigm centered on underestimating natural forces, complacency from past successes, and using human loss scales for cost-benefit decisions. With commercial shipping expanding exponentially to support global ambitions, urgent reforms and mindset changes were needed. The British Titanic inquiry chaired by Lord Mersey in 1912, and the American version led by Senator William Alden Smith delved through details behind the unprecedented Atlantic catastrophe through extensive witness accounts. Beyond determining key failure points like inadequate lifeboats, discounted ice warnings, dangerously fast nighttime transit speed, and flawed evacuation drills, procedures, they crucially established critical human errors stemming from arrogance, negligence, and outdated regulations lagging behind megaship innovations. White Star Line management and crew accounts tried obscuring the truth but eventually succumbed under an evidence barrage. Findings shattered public trust in shipping safety claims. 
The inquiry's outcomes became instrumental catalysts for mandating improved marine legislation and tightening enforcement to restore faith and force conglomerates into line. International efforts like the 1914 Safety of Life at Sea or the Solace Treaty played a pivotal role by creating stability, structure, and compliance accountability mechanisms hitherto missing. It established 24-7 wireless communication, trained crew drills, accessible life jackets, boats for all, and ship inspections, among other changes. Updates responded to incidents over the century like 1966's SS Heraklion disaster producing stronger designs, unity, and responsibility across private and governmental players in marine travel's lifeblood. Industry practices transformed from lax ceremonial traditions relying upon crew intuition at sea to codified procedures with smaller margins of human discretion. Lifeboat capacity upgrade from Titanic's 20. Hull markings and dedicated safety departments focused solely on passenger welfare even in emergencies. Real-time disaster reporting improved for swifter rescue coordination. While economics still contributed to underlying risk factors, ethical commercial success adjusted itself to avoid repeating history's lessons written in blood. The Wreckage For over seven decades since the RMS Titanic's final surrender to the icy Atlantic waves, Numerous expeditions attempted to explore the depths, plunging over 12,400 feet in search of the lost nautical icon. The undiscovered wreck site endured constant buffeting by deep underwater currents, sweeping away lighter remnants of grandeur, while stronger metallic hull remnants possibly buried themselves deeper into sediments, clouded by poor visibility that foiled era-appropriate search technologies. False positives like the British liner Athenia confused early efforts, and interest gradually waned in unlocking maritime graveyards for fear of disturbing hallowed remains. In August 1985, esteemed American oceanographer Dr. Robert Ballard transformed destiny by initiating a revolutionary 32-day Titanic locator mission on the research vessel Knorr. Leading an innovative French-American expedition equipped with state-of-the-art deep-diving submersibles, a remotely operated vehicle called Argo, and advanced sonar technology, this mission marked a crucial juncture, highlighting the seamless integration of science, exploration, and cutting-edge robotics. Assisted positioning systems calculated likely drift sites from reference points until discernible debris patterns were spotted under remnant boilers and a bow section looming suddenly out of the darkness onto screens. Repeated sweeps using Argo and Anglia mini-subs and sonar captured haunting images burned into modern memory. Titanic's giant propellers half-buried in the ocean floor, corroded powerful engines once generating steam for the floating behemoth city, poignantly personal suitcases hinting at passengers convinced of retrieval, and her mighty two-piece skeletal frame enveloped by darkness evoking ghostly visions of the once-glorious Dream Palace. Unlike predecessors obsessed with treasure hunting, Ballard ensured preliminary surveys minimally disturbed the gravesite with submarine cameras, but no physical contact. His humility explained subsequent missions as explorations, demonstrating the deep power-producing tragedy from humanity's brashness. Seeking answers but respecting Titanic's eternal role as a memorial, never for commercial plunder. Later years, plagued by controversial artifact thefts and private dive trips, did not detract from Ballard's precedent. Continued preservation efforts using memorial plaques keep alive his directive underscoring why Titanic still matters beyond romantic disaster storylines. How 1500 perished, creating modern safety reforms and why collectively respecting such lessons shuns repeating past arrogance. Rediscovering Titanic a second fateful April night 72 years later, thus fittingly turned the lens inwards making humanity question hubris instead of outward for financial spoils. Ballard and Titanic remind us of primal forces demanding caution alongside possibility when exploring blank frontiers armed with intelligence. This is the greatest lost treasure brought back memorably from history's most unforgettable wreck site. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.